Good evening. I'm calling to order the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, November 17th, 2022. I'm Liz Exton, the chair. Permit me to confirm that all remote members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Oh boy, I can't see this. Um, Ms. Ferranti, I'm gonna just, go. our AEA rep, I see her. Can you hear me? No, can they not hear me? All of a sudden why we do this makes sense now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just <laughs> I'm thinking that this audio is not going. Test, test, test. There we go. Okay. Now, can the people on Zoom hear me? No? Yes? Ms. Ferrante, can you hear me? <laughs> Her sound is off. Oh, I, there. Just join in. This morning I was cursing you and Leo because I am Coleman Bruno. I was for sure saying I heard all of this. I'm gonna give you two. I'm gonna give you two. No, but he was really upset. Yeah, no, see, okay, oh, so she said. She test, 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 one, two, one, two. She said she can't Test, 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 one, two, one, two. It's, it's working. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Can the people on Zoom hear me? Okay, yes, we're getting some thumbs up yes. now. All right, excellent, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> all right, we're gonna try this again. Um, please confirm, please permit me to confirm that all remote members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Ms. Ferrante? Yes, I'm here and I can hear you. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, oh, I can't. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey? Yep. And I can't, I can't read all of these names, so I'm, Dr. Homan, do you know? Um, when we get, I, I can read them. Here. Okay, and they're here, you're here for school improvement plans, so when we get to those, we will, we can double check. Oh, Dr. Janger, I think is, yeah, okay. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a hybrid model. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. And Mr. Hainer will not be with us this evening. Um, the first item on our agenda is public comment, but we do not have anyone signed up for public comment. So we will move into Arlington High School student representatives. Welcome. Yeah, if you can take that mic or you can move to that chair for. Hi, <clears throat> can people on Zoom hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, updates from the high school. The girls cross country team made it to states, which is huge. We're very proud of them. And HS is hosting its biggest school dance ever. Um, we're having 500 people come, very exciting. It's tomorrow night from seven to 10. Fun. Okay. Great, thank you so much for being here. All right, um, the next item on our agenda is a field trip approval for Arlington High School, Dr. Danger. Yes, is Mr. D'Agostino here as well? No, I don't see him, okay. <clears throat> um, so we are looking, we have just begun last year, there was one international trip resumed uh, following COVID. 
and this year we have, we are hoping to resume our Italy trip. So part of the reason this request is coming late is because there's a lot of history behind it, and we felt like with the the interest and experience, even though it was a, a late proposal, we felt we, we were prepared to do it. So the plan, as we have done every year or every other year since for about the last 15 years is for our music program, both instrumental and choral music, to travel to Italy. Um, the travel company is a company that we've worked with for the last 15 years. Um, they base themselves in the current model of the trip in Varese, which is in the north, and then do trips around northern Italy and then up into uh, southern Switzerland, performing in various venues, and then they do a residency at um, the Lugano Conservatory in Switzerland with um, professors and students there. I was fortunate enough to go on the trip a few years ago, and it is, it's wonderful. The kids are great, the travel is great, the coordinators are great, um, and the experience of performing in these places, I mean, the two things I'll just take away is sort of, one was um, when we went to a performing arts high school in Italy, and they performed um, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, and all the students started singing along. And so Mr. D'Agostino stopped and invited all the students on stage. And so we had a 300-person performance of Bohemian Rhapsody with uh, Italian Performing Arts High School. And then my other favorite thing was when they were performing at the conservatory in Lugano, I stepped outside um, and watched as the conservatory students would walk by, hear the music, try to figure out who is performing, peek in the door, and then run and get their friends and all start pouring in. So it's a wonderful experience. Um, so we are looking for approval for that. I can easily answer questions if you have questions about precautions we're taking, some of the changes we put in place post COVID, um, things that we learned during that rapid cancellation or anything else around that. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? Ms. Morgan. This is a trip that's only, sorry, that's only actually open to honors level students, correct? No, it is open to anyone in the instrumental or choral music program. Okay, that's not what it says on the Do I have that application. wrong? The application says you have to be an honors orchestra, um, um, madrigals, or jazz band. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're correct, and I'm reading it wrong. Right, so it is not the general choral or the general um, band, correct? And the way honors level works in the music program, I wish Mr. D'Agostino was here for that, is um, those are advanced ensembles. I move approval. <clears throat> Second. We have a motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Mr. Schlickman to approve. Um, hey, I, had, I had a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, the AHS music program field trip in Italy to Italy in February 2023. Discussion, Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, Dr. Janger, what, I, I didn't see anything about what plans were if a student tested COVID on, posit, tested positive for COVID during the trip because what I was reading online is that current regulations in Italy require a five day quarantine and then you have to be symptom free for two days before you can leave. So it could continue past five days. And I know I've had a friend who's been on a trip and I mean, it was an adult trip and stuff and they didn't have really great plans if you tested positive. So I would be, I'd really like to know what they have. I mean, I hope this isn't an issue. Uh, I know our kids are vaccinated and stuff, but still it's possible. And given Italy's rules, I want to know where are the kids going to stay or, or, you know, that plans would be made. Yeah. I mean, so the insur the, the big change that we've made is that the, there's a fairly hefty insurance policy now standard in the past. Some of those insurance policies were optional. Um, and so, I was going to just pulling that up and I'd have to go page by page to find your concerns, but there is coverage for illness, um, interrupted stay as well as extended stay. 
and we would work with the insurance, we would work with the travel company to allow them to stay there and leave a chaperone in order for them to stay. It obviously, with any illness, depends on the particular conditions, right? We've had illnesses in the past where kids couldn't travel for longer periods of time and then parents come over. Um, most of that is covered by the insurance policy that's in place. Okay, that's great. I just want to be sure that our kids are covered if something was to happen. No, that's a good question. And I actually, I appreciate your logistical thinking about that. And we'll make sure we have a conversation with the uh, providers. Um, Dr. Jang, my question is, um, what opportunities are there for students who would like to go on this trip, but um, the finances are a challenge for them? Sure. So um, we have uh, created in the past a an, an international travel scholarship fund. Um, there's up to $10,000 currently set aside for international scholarships. I think PAPA is also planning on providing a little bit more support for that. Um, there, as soon as they're approved, we'll share that information with students and students can apply. We also build a little bit of a cushion into the um, pricing of these um, through an administrative fee so that um, in the case of sometimes late in the game, there are smaller things, you know, someone can't afford some piece of the, the food or the, the fees um, and so we make sure there's a little bit of a cushion in there if there's a needs-based issue there. But the main issue approach is the international travel scholarship, which I believe is shared in the packet. Um, I revised the timeline because this is running a little shorter. So I gave the example of the timeline we followed in the past. But what we would do as soon as this was passed was make the information available to students so that they could apply. Students have the, there's two deadlines for deposits. Um, $500 and then a second deposit of $500. Um, the mo those, then the final payment is only necessary 30 days before. So if there was a student who might be questionable about whether they could afford it, we'd also work with them. Thank you. Any other questions or comments before we take a vote? Uh, all right. Uh, we had a motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Mr. Schlickman to approve the HS field trip. Roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? No. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's six in favor, um, one Five. opposed. Five, thank you. Five in favor, one opposed. All right. Uh, school improvement plans, the bracket school. Welcome. If you wanna, those of you who are in person can step up to the table. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Welcome. Um, don't need so to share that. My name is Stephanie Zerjikoff. I'm principal at Bracket. Um, best job in the world, in my opinion. And tonight we have our interim assistant principals, Eileen Woods, who's on um, Zoom, and Jen Rich, who are off to a wonderful start serving the community this year. Members of our leadership team who are here on this presentation, our classroom teachers, Suzanne Kaminsky and Callie Russo, who are on Zoom, as well as our literacy coach, Lorraine Kerr, math coach, Michelle Crawley, our amazing math director, Matt Coleman, who is here, and our school council member, Elizabeth Rollins. I'd like to recognize all the contributors and reviewers of our plans with a special thank you to the members of the School Improvement Council listed here on our first slide. We thank the school committee, Superintendent Liz Holman, Assistant Superintendents um, Allison Elmer, Michael Mason, and Rod McNeil for their continuing championing and support of the Brackett School community. Our second, our agenda this evening will be an introduction. Point it at me. Clicker. Pointed at Liz. <laughs> All right. 
I'll drive. <laughs> okay. Uh, an introduction to bracket, uh, bracket wins and challenges, the roadmap, priorities for 22, 23, key initiatives, action steps, resources to support our success, and questions and answers with the community pictures. Tonight, we will frame our initiatives as they relate to our overarching goal of equity and climate. We begin by sharing with you a glimpse of Bracket this year. We continue to be a vibrant and active learning community where we find joy in learning together, guided by our mission, vision, and core values of respect, responsibility, and love of learning. The life of Bracket School is, of course, our 200 and 429 students in grades kindergarten through five, in addition to the specialist areas and our SLC three to five learning center. We have a supportive culture and provide meaningful and engaging instruction because we deliberately work to invest students in their learning. Our 70 staff members are focused on developing and nurturing trusting relationships and fostering a sense of whole school belonging. <clears throat> We embrace and partner with our PTO and school council throughout the year. Through our weekly grade level ACE blocks, we continue to collaborate with teachers, service providers, and coaches in reviewing student growth, performance, and instructional practices. We cultivate curiosity through discovery and exploration, and we facilitate and focus every faculty meeting on our initiatives through professional development. Our instructional leadership team established this year is collaborating to improve instruction by focusing on student learning and achievement, as well as building teacher capacity through differentiated support. Our teaching staff is nurturing the qualities necessary for building equity, excellence, and academic and social emotional growth for all students. Okay. Slide four, uh, slide four aligns bracket with the Arlington District vision of fostering a school classroom culture of belonging, joy, growth, and empowerment. We are intentionally building a classroom climate that supports the emotional and social needs of our learners. And we look to monitor student participation and implement active learning strategies, ensuring that every student is heard and engaged. This area of focus will have a direct and positive effect on student learning and achievement. New this year, we've implemented a student government model for fifth grade students, and they're working in different committees. We have a student issue committee, a spirit committee, community service work, and the students are sharing their voices and their focus is on belonging. We've developed an effective weekly communication model between school and home, we just held a culture in creativity night, which was wonderful. Um, we had a primary K to one math night uh, this week, and we have some upcoming math and literacy events planned. And throughout the year, we'll have principal morning coffees, highlighting our work and providing an opportunity for families to engage in open conversation. Our equity and climate goal will be embedded into all of our work as we build a welcoming, equitable community at Bracket. Through professional development, our goal is to increase our understanding of social justice and identity, integrating culturally responsive practices, and promoting student voice and choice. Our instructional objectives prioritize both math and literacy instruction. Our discourse objective aims to build teacher capacity in tier one instruction by integrating practices that improve student discourse. Our data and differentiation objective will utilize a collaborative model for tier one instruction, employing small group differentiation based on evolving student progress in grades K to five. We will present our equity and climate goal first. Slide six is the results of the panorama survey, which shows a low percentage of favorable responses to cultural awareness and action questions at Bracket. 
The survey and the Arlington Equity Audit show a need for additional work and cultural responsiveness in our community. As a result, our goal is to increase our understanding of social justice and identity, integrating culturally responsive teaching practices and promoting student voices. This year, Brackett staff will embrace courageous conversations, professional development, and collaborative partnerships with Brackett families to build a welcoming, equitable community where all voices are heard sensitively and respectfully. Through our professional development work, we will continue to deepen our understanding of identity and how to engage students in conversation around culture and race. Additionally, we will organize our resources at ACE and during common planning time with our Director of Equity and Inclusion, SEL, and Social Studies Coach Support as it relates to culturally responsive teaching and learning and a, lens, a sense of belonging for students and families to ensure equal opportunity for all with an inclusive lens. Additionally, we will work with our instructional leadership team consultant by planning focused faculty workshops and student family presentations. Our art, music, and physical education specialists will engage students to share and express their identity and heritage and integrate that information into instruction that attempts to deepen their knowledge and pride about belonging to, to a culture with the goal of developing their cognitive well-being and inner self-worth. Brackett has embraced the district's science of reading initiatives and has been teaching phonological awareness and phonics in grades K through three with fidelity. When we compare the cohort of students in first grade at the beginning of last year to those same students at the beginning of this year in grade two, we can see positive growth trends iReady data in grades three through five confirms the strength of phonics knowledge. Brackett staff will continue to provide systematic, solid phonological awareness and phonics instruction, one half of Scarborough's reading rope. iReady data in grades three through five show a need for more targeted comprehension instruction and a renewed focus on vocabulary building. MCAS results point to a strong need for improved writing instruction across the genres. This all leads us to focus on the other half of the reading rope, language acquisition. Increasing student talk throughout the day, sharing their thinking, rehearsing their writing orally, will build language skills that directly impact reading and writing performance. When we analyzed the 2022 MCAS data by domains, we saw that our students scored higher than state averages in each of the mathematics domains of geometry, measurement and data, number and operations in base 10 and fractions, and operations and algebraic thinking. Despite learning disruption, disruptions that occurred in the 2020 and 2021 school years, our students are performing above state levels in all content areas. iReady data also points to positive growth trends across the content areas in mathematics for grade three through five. Our MCAS data is also demonstrating a need for inclusive, engaging learning environments that welcome all students into the math community. A disproportionality between high needs and non high needs students in our school compelled us to reflect on our math communities, discussions, and identities. We will utilize a collaborative press in model to modify tier one instruction while differentiating in order to provide access points and increased rigor for all of our students. Through our culturally responsive practices and by integrating practices that improve student discourse, we will build stronger teacher capacity in tier one instruction. Bracket staff will prepare strong readers and writers by strengthening oral and written language development and daily interaction with a variety of texts to pro promote reading comprehension. Teachers will increase student engagement in math by integrating reflective classroom math discussions and strengthening instructional math strategies that elicit mathematical thinking and discourse from students. Bracket staff will continue to implement a data-informed collaborative model for tier one math and ELA instruction, employing small group differentiation based on evolving student progress in grades K through five. Teachers will use core district formal and informal literacy assessments in phonics, 
phonological awareness, reading comprehension, vocabulary, and writing to monitor student progress and tailor instruction using small, flexible groups. Teachers will use district formal and formal math assessments and screeners to monitor student progress and tailor instruction using flexible groupings. The current resources that we are grateful for are our full-time literacy coach and reading specialist and interventionist, focusing our math faculty meetings with professional development aligned with district and bracket initiatives, full-time math coach and interventionists in the collaboration with curriculum directors and district coaches, and of course our very supportive PTO. Um, we need to support, what we need to support our plan would be ongoing professional development in the areas of differentiation, student discourse, culturally responsive teaching and SEL practices, and an additional reading specialist. Next slide. Thank you for your attention to our improvement plan and for supporting the important work of teaching and learning. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the committee? Dr. Allison Ampia, if you can't even see you, so. I'm good, thank you. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Mr. Slickman. Okay. <clears throat> I'm a little fuzzy on your desired outcomes. Okay. Which I think are the most important part. I mean, I'm very appreciative of a needs assessment and actions you're gonna take. But the reason why these actions are being taken are to have some sort of a measurable outcome. So that next year we can take a look at it and see uh, have we been successful? If we're addressing second grade literacy, what sort of metric or outcome do we have? Now the one thing that I'm really puzzled by is you stated in your document a 10% increase in MCAS scores. Now, MCAS runs from 440 to 560. So if you've got a grade four ELA score of 507.6, 10% increase on that would be 558.4. And I don't think you mean that, because that's really un okay. unattainable. So you really need to clarify what, what your increase will be in MCAS, if that's sort of your desired outcome that you're okay. putting in the plan. You, you what we can, can I hear what you were thinking about? Because uh, I can maybe help you to word that a little better. Dr. Hellman, do you want to? Uh, can you clarify what data, which slide you're looking at? Yeah, I, I uh, it's, in the, the it's in the plan. No, oh, it's, it's in the plan. In the plan. Document. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, can you ask your question again? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I sort. Yeah, can I get a sense of what you were thinking? you were trying to achieve with the MCAS? I, I guess maybe the percentage was inaccurate, but definitely an increase. And um, I guess it can be too high. Well, uh, but, you know, right, you I might be really thinking about a 10% increase. Um, percent increase. In, mm -hmm. scores and the mm -hmm. district mm -hmm. scores as well. But the under, yeah, if you're thinking a 10% increase in the number of uh, students who are attaining, uh, attaining um, mastery, or, you yeah. know, you, 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 that, that could be where you're trying to go with this. And I'm, that's my assumption, but what you, what you. 10% of the students going from one level to the next level, rather than needs improvement or almost meeting mm -hmm. into the meeting category. Yeah, your, your problem here is I used to do this for a living. and and, and, and I look at this pretty critically. And I want you to be successful. I really want you to be successful and I want you to come up with a metric that is both meaningful and attainable. Right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Mr. Steelman. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Good to see you all. I know Mrs. Zerchikoff well and it's nice to see you. Thanks for all your service to our town and our children. And uh, the only thing, the one thing I did want to kind of just ask if you could expand upon the group 
We have heard a lot about phonics in the news <coughs> recently and sort of the transition of more of a focus on phonics. And I'm just curious to know what that looks like from a faculty level in terms of professional development, conversations inside the building about that move. <coughs> We've been using um, foundation. You well, you just moved the mic. Oh, right. sorry. oh, sorry. I thought I had my big girl voice on. Um, we've been using foundations uh, with certainly with fidelity in grades kindergarten, first, second, and third. We increased it this year, as well as Hegarty. And what it looks like in the classroom is really entertaining, look, talking about words. Tell me which words rhyme. It, they're very quick. They're um, fun, sun dog, which two rhyme, and the students will say that it's done in whole group, and kindergarten will do it in small groups. Then they'll switch out, say playground, you, the word playground, say it without the word play. Um, funny, then there's hand motions, put together funny, funny. Mm -hmm. So children are manipulating sounds and manipulating words, and they'll, I, I, Lorraine, our Co our reading coach was watch working with a class today and they were like, do it again, do it again. It's fun talking about the words for the students and how, how sounds relate so that they can better uh, sound out words when they see them. Cool, I just wanted to, yeah. Just yeah, it's, <coughs> it's, it's usually def one of the first subjects in the morning you'll see in first grade and in kindergarten and it's, it's really, it's, it's just amazing Sounds to see. Sounds like a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun, and so they don't know they rhyme that part. Yeah, that's right. right. All right, thank you. I just, wanted, I just wanted a little more context on that because it's, it's just been something that people have asked about. <clears throat> Mr. Cardin. Hello. Thank Hi. you all for all your hard work. Uh, first, this is a very detailed uh, SIP. I, I've seen an improvement over the years, and it's really great. I, hopefully, it's because of the assistant principal assistance you have you're able to get get this level of detail it's great to see um, so just a quick question on the on the professional development what particularly for the differentiated differentiated learning you know at the high school level for the HDI initiative they sort of had an intensive um, professional development over the summer mm -hmm. is that sort of what you need or do you think it can be accomplished during the school year I think it can be accomplished or it can certainly be accomplished we have our coaches that are working with the teachers at each level and talking mm -hmm. about, you know, how how we showing models, they'll they'll also model in classrooms. So that's really built in to the school day and to the to the school week. Um, for the for the equity and inclusion, we've been um, working out a contract with uh, Carlos Hoyt. In fact, I, they met today um, to have him come and work with families, to work with students, and to work with faculty. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Morgan. Um, thank you so much. This was great. I really, um, I appreciated looking at your, um, you know, really, I appreciated your sort of honesty around the panorama data and, and the work that you have to do there. Um, I was sort of interested. I was, um, I had pulled some, some information from the 21-22 school year um, and was looking at sort of like demographics across our elementary schools. and. I will admit, as somebody who's been here for a long time, I was really surprised Brackett has the highest percentage of students with disabilities amongst all seven of our schools. Not necessarily the highest needs, but like just the largest percentage and the largest percentage of students that are um, multi-race, non-Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that is not the, is not the reputation sometimes that Brackett has in our community. And so I think that the work that, that you guys are doing to, to talk about this and to be really transparent about it, um, you do have a really diverse student body. Um, and so um, I, 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 think that it's, I think that it's great and I, I am excited about where this will go for, for Brackett and, and all of our kids who are there, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a, a brief comment. Um, I, I really appreciated the, f the focus also on third through fifth grade and the comprehension. I think so much of the focus recently on reading and the science of reading has been on the younger grades and the phonics and the phonological awareness. And um, I do worry a little bit that we may be losing sight of the other um, strands of Scarborough's rope. So I appreciated that that you all are thinking about that as well. And then my question for you is, um, 
you mentioned in the needs um, a reading interventionist, but so much of the conversation is about the tier one instruction, mm -hmm. which is really more where a coach is supporting a teacher. Can you just briefly sort of, for all of our benefit, <coughs> What would be, why, why, why is an interventionist in this case, um, do you see that as a, a more of a priority than another coach or just? Thank you for asking that because <clears throat> way, the way we're using our interventionists, our, our goal is to have them as a press-in model in a classroom so that you've got the teacher working with a group of students, you've got a interventionists working all in the same so that they can um, so they can learn from each other and they can understand the children all get to work with an interventionist as well as a classroom teacher so it it helps both the teacher with the modeling and it helps the students to get more individualized attention thank you you're welcome Thank you all very much for Dr. Hammond, sorry. I just want to say thank you to the bracket team for a very comprehensive school improvement plan and for all of the members who are joining you remotely. And here, I will say bracket has been exceptionally thoughtful about their implementation of the ILT this year. It's clear they have a very large collaborative team working with them um, and have been really very aligned with the work that the district is doing and had piloted a lot of push-in model intervention and small group flexible intervention last year. And it's really exciting to see some of that expanding. So nice job, team. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, I, while we're transitioning um, to the Bishop team, Tamaki, I just wanted to say welcome, and I'm sorry we um, missed you. If there's, we heard about cross country and the dance, but if there's anything else you wanted to add, uh, there's a dodgeball tournament coming up. All right. <laughs> Always fun things happen. <coughs> all right. Um, the Bishop School Improvement Plan, welcome. Yeah, good evening, uh, members of the school committee, um, Chair Exton. Uh, this is actually an exciting uh, night. We're meeting in person. It's the first time that I've seen you all in person in uh, a few years, and it's uh, really exciting to be here tonight to uh, talk about the work that we're doing at Bishop. Uh, before we get started, I need to um, introduce two rock stars um, to the Bishop, of the Bishop team. Uh, to my right here, I have Maria Amato who is our uh, full-time literacy coach. And to my left, I have um, Emily Veter, who is one of our math coaches. Uh, we split to position 0.5. Emily is also the district math team leader. So um, as we uh, get started tonight, we're gonna update you on Bishop's priorities uh, as a response to the data that we're gonna present and that you find in the school improvement plan, along with uh, currently initiated uh, action steps that are going to, uh, that are addressing our problem of practice. Uh, we're going to share some wins that uh, show that the work that we're doing um, has yielded positive results um, already, and uh, we're going to wrap up by taking any questions that you have. So we've uh, started the year at the Bishop with about 403 students. Uh, it's about 10, uh, an increase of 10 from last year. Uh, we had a large turnover of support staff and uh, specialists last year or over the summer, so we onboarded or in the process of onboarding 15 new staff, uh, ranging from support staff, classroom teachers, and specialists. Um, Bishop's core values of respect, responsibility, and regard for others and their differences is uh, threaded into everything we do into our community. Uh, in addition to our core values, as we, um, the APS community, uh, links arms related to our newly crafted vision statement, uh, at Bishop, you know, we aspire for students to continually gain confidence in their individual learning abilities and styles uh, so they can grow and develop as active learners. Uh, we also like to motivate our students to respect each other's differences, uh, encouraging them to care for each other in the learning process so that each child uh, feels a sense of belonging as an individual and empowered as a member of our school community. So I'd like to start uh, by saying that um, we're going to use MCAS data tonight, but the MCAS data is not exclusive uh, to the, the sets of data that we use in our work uh, in, in our school. Uh, but I'd like to start with you know this community-facing data related to the spring 2002 MCAS uh, compared to the district and state grades uh, three through eight uh, uh, bishops represented in green, 
with the district in orange and um, the state in blue. Pretty proud of uh, our, our results, uh, you know, compared to the state and, uh, you know, really proud to, you know, be aligned with uh, uh, the district's average. Um, so, um, as a reminder to the committee, the last year when I was here uh, remotely, um, I highlighted Bishop's key priorities and problem of practice uh, related to the academic achievement gap that currently exists um, using MCAS as a main data set. Um, this data remains a catalyst for Bishop's problem of practice. Um, so this five-year look over time of our high-need subgroup compared to the Bishop aggregate uh, continues to be a compelling uh, problem for us. Um, so the graph on the left is Bishop's ELA scores, grades three through five, uh, with the one on the right here being math uh, and uh, science, technology, and engineering will be um, uh, the next slide with the high needs identified in red. There's our high needs. I mean, I'm sorry, our uh, science, technology, and engineering. Uh, so as we move on to uh, revisiting Bishop's priorities, if you remember, we're, on, we're in our second year of a three-year plan. Um, uh, I'm going to focus mainly on the key instructional objectives for this presentation, with objectives three and four being um, just as important, um, I'm, and I'm happy to take questions regarding those two at the end. Um, looking at our instructional objective number one around student achievement, is mainly focused on improving Bishop's data collection process for the purpose of designing interventions through collaborative um, teaming, um, also known as ACE blocks, faculty meetings, and staff um, common planning time. And objective number two uh, is around, uh, focused on data analysis and math uh, in math and ELA. Um, the focus is on the use of those assessments to inform our instruction, uh, best practices, and interventions, which are directly to, tied to that collaborative data team work. Um, for example, uh, with our early childhood grade level teams, it makes sense to direct our efforts uh, toward early reading skills, lesson delivery, uh, best practice, and using assessments to drive instruction. As we move on to objective three, the focus on equity and school culture, uh, which is a consistent thread found um, throughout the Bishop School Improvement Plan, uh, Bishop's positive behavioral interventions and supports uh, are up and running. Uh, we have a series of professional development for staff, uh, daily mentions, and work with our students uh, with the purpose of creating uh, common expectations for all individuals in our building. And then uh, the fourth objective focuses on the management and operations, so dedicated to maintaining brick and mortar assessments and remediations, in addition to focus on um, student class placement every year and hiring practices at Bishop. So this is the point in the conversation that really excites me. Um, I, I guess mentioned em, uh, Emily and Maria are going to speak in a second. And before they do, I just want to um, say that your support for full-time coaches in all seven of our <coughs> elementary schools is uh, proving um, invaluable. Uh, the skill and expertise of these professionals has, uh, that they've brought to the table has just made a huge, huge difference in our work. Uh, we'll um, pass it on to Emily. Thank you, Mark. Um, so the work of our ILT has led to math initiatives that support um, that objective too that Mark was talking about, um, where we're focusing on collecting real-time data about how students make sense of mathematics. So the first thing that we're doing is um, a district-wide focus on fluency screeners in grades K to three. Um, while there's a lot more to mathematical understanding than just fluency, um, using these one-on-one -on -one interviews to collect data on how students make sense of foundational facts um, is helping us to inform next steps. So we introduced the screeners this year through grade level PD. Um, and then at Bishop, we've been meeting with teacher teams and administrators to continue to collaborate, um, to calibrate, sorry, our um, scoring during our ACE meetings um, by watching videos of our own students. Um, so now we're at the point where the coaches can be thought partners with the teachers as we think about how to sp support specific students in tier one. Um, who sh and then also um, thinking about now that we have a new interventionist, a math interventionist, thinking about which students um, should be seeing her in tier two. Um, we're also um, collect tracking unit assessment data in grades three to five, um, and we've organized it by content. 
So um, we've gone back and revisited exemplars provided by the curriculum and scored the assessments together. Um, and really starting to cal calibrating our scoring has led to important conversations about our mathematical goals. Um, and again, you can see the spreadsheets here um, that are color coded so that we can very quickly look at it and think about who we need to support in tier, tier one and who needs to see our interventionist in tier two. So I'm gonna pass it off to Maria Amato, our building-based literacy coach. Um, and I just wanna say it's been invaluable to collaborate with her as we start to put into practice this vision for coaching that was drafted by the coaching design team last year. Thank you, Emily. I feel similar. I think we're a great team, you, Carolyn, and I. So um, similar to math, teachers and coaches are working together to use assessments to inform our instruction. And our district literacy assessments um, include the Dibbles in the DRA in, the early, in early elementary and iReady and MCAS in the upper grades. So this battery of assessments um, really helps us create individual learning profiles for our students and helps inform our instruction both whole class and small group. Um, so for example, in grades K through three in Bishop, we're using Dibbles data to help us create differentiated targeted phonics instruction. Um, and as some of you know, the Dibbles is a benchmark assessment. We use it three times a year, which helps us detect risk and monitor the development of early literacy and early reading skills. Um, so in ACE meetings, when we meet together with coaches and teachers like me, um, we're working on analyzing data. And you can see up here on the slide on the left are spreadsheets that the coaches create, I created this one on the left, where we color code and we sort our data and we sit with teachers and we analyze this. And then we use a sorting protocol, which you can see on the right. This happens to be a second grade um, team here from Bishop. And we use this protocol to be able to sort our students into targeted instructional groups. Um, and of course, our goal is to meet the needs of all our students in reading. In the upper grades, grades three through five, we use our data to form targeted comprehension groups. And we're going in there to model these things as coaches so that teachers can see it in action. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Emily. Uh, so uh, these next three slides you can um, uh, look at as a return on your investment um, as far as supporting coaches and interventions in our in our buildings um, it's making a huge difference uh, so this day data uh, represents the closure and the gaps from 2019 to 2022 looking at the percentages of meeting and exceeding on uh, MCAS grades three through five um, and also if you look at the student growth percentiles on the right there um, there is growth amongst all students um, the um, high needs are the ones on the on the bottom that said yes uh, 2018 to 2022 um, and um, it numbers above 40 is an indicator of high growth and um, we are seeing progress uh, across the board uh, you got to demonstrating that you know whatever is good for one group of students is good for all students and we're seeing growth uh, like I said across the board and we're seeing closure in gap so um, this is math and so from 19 to 22 we have a 16 percent closure in the gap with an 18 percent closure in the gap in ELA uh, with uh, this pretty phenomenal uh, student growth percentile, um, percentile uh, of both uh, with the high needs at 70.5 and 13% uh, drop in the achievement gap between science, technology, and engineer, engineering. We uh, don't have a SGP fifth grade. It's the first time and only time that they take that, so there's nothing to compare um, that to. So I just want uh, you to take a moment. I also wanted to share this, uh, a little uh, classroom teacher feedback. Um, I have a first grade teacher and a fifth grade teacher here that was uh, kind enough uh, to um, offer some feedback for tonight's presentation. I just want to say that this, uh, you know, this work can't be done without the buy-in uh, from everyone. And I've just been incredibly impressed with their professionalism, their commitment to best practices and making child-centered uh, decisions. So as you take a look at the resources needed um, that we currently have to sustain um, our effectiveness within our programming, um, I'm gonna to conclude tonight's presentation. 
Uh, there are more objectives and action steps found within the Bishop School Improvement Plan, and I'm happy to take any questions related to those uh, that we presented tonight. I just want to thank you all again for your support uh, for our schools, our staff, our students, and community. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Thielman. Thank you very much. I, I, I do want to echo what I think that someone else said. The presentations, the, the school improvement plans have gotten better and better and better. So thanks for all the mm -hmm. work. I know there's a lot of work that goes into it, and I know not everyone likes to come to the school committee and make a presentation. Um, <clears throat> my, I, I didn't realize that the ELL population has doubled since 2017. That was interesting mm -hmm. to see. I, hadn't, I just didn't know that. So thanks for putting that in there. Mm -hmm. My question is about... Um, Goal four, I think it is about sustainability, and the and we actually talked about this a little bit. But the the, the building, your, your your plan to enhance the main office and submit a proposal for that. Yes, I'm just curious where that stands. Is that <coughs> uh, so? Yep, yeah, Michael. Yeah, I don't know if that's a question for you. Or yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Michael and I have been working closely together, okay. so I think it's appropriate yeah. for Michael to speak to this. Yeah. So. Um, we currently, we've engaged in a, with an architect to okay. try to do initial scoping out of the redesign of the space. Um, we're waiting for that design to come back, right. um, as well as we have submitted a request for funding to the capital plan. To the capital plan. Yeah, for fiscal okay, 24. Yeah. Okay. It sounds like that will actually, people don't like to talk a lot about structural improvements in buildings, but they actually do help the flow of the building, the sphere of the building. Mm -hmm. So. I, I applaud you for putting that right in there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the more you uh, support and um, uh, allow us to bring in more staff, more specialized staff in the building, there's a need for space. Yeah. And we have a large footprint in our, um, in our front office that can absolutely be maximized by adding two to possibly three uh, additional offices. Yes, you guys do have that large space. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Mr. Sligman. I, I, I like your plan. Um, and I'm really heartened to see you taking uh, time on, I think it's page 13, page 12, uh, talking about your EL, uh, English learner population. Um, the, I, I'm going to be a little picky here, but I'm just going to do this by way of getting to another question. Uh, you're listing as an outcome by September of 2022. Bishop's ELL teaching team will have increased to 2.0. Did that happen? Yes. Well, that, that's sort of not an outcome. That's more, really more of an action step, and I'm glad to have that there, that you recognize the need for, and, and we've collaborated to recognize that need. Uh, and then you're following up with, uh, with, with uh, the statement, you know, that's a 2022 statement as well. 53% of B Bishop's ELL students have made progress in access. By June of 23, 70% of Bishop's ELLs will score in the making progress range. Um, I, I, I guess my question is, just to get a little more of a flavor, of, so, so one of the outcomes you're pointing to with the increase in staff is that you're in compliance with state. Are you in compliance with state on, on EL instruction? We are now. Well, okay, that, that's sort of the, that's sort of, that is the uh, outcome, is that we are now in compliance because we've added, added the staffing. Um, do you have any other challenges you're hitting here with the ELS population that we should know about that we can support you with? Because the, the ELS population, I, I really feel is that from our side, we're not looking at hard enough yeah no I, and I appreciate the, the the question and focus on our ELs and since we have um, uh, added the additional um, mm -hmm. EL teacher um, we're able to kind of look at restructuring the way that we provide services for our ELs mm -hmm. Uh, with not so much of uh, all um, pull out model, but uh, we're now we're starting to push in more, um, and we're able to kind of spread the wealth. Um, our two EL teachers have now um, they're actually working with all ELs, so that all of our ELs um, can um, uh, we'll, we'll see them mm -hmm. as you know their supports, not just one of the EL teachers. Um, as far as um, you know, this is evolving. So it's just, we just received the, the second um, EL teacher this year. So we're trying, we're working with uh, Carla Brzezzi and uh, the department to kind of come up with a uh, program that's going to be most effective uh, to see 
um, you know, a, a better progress with our, our ELs mm -hmm. and, um, and our support with staff as well. Is, um, you know, tier one and having, a, you know, a cluster, um, uh, multiple ELs in one classroom requires mm -hmm. a lot of attention. And so building that capacity at a tier one level with our, uh, with our teachers is, um, is extremely important as what well. What percentage so. of your mainstream classroom teachers have the endorsement on their license? Uh, you know we, we are at 95%. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Any, any noting, any changes in languages uh, that you're receiving? No changes. Basically just more of the same? Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. Um, so two questions. One might actually be for Dr. Homan, but the first one, the, the reliable district data collection system and platform. I mean, is that, it, can PowerSchool do that? Does PowerSchool talk to iReady and MCAS and get all that, or is there something No, we, we, we're, we don't use PowerSchool in elementary for okay. that. Um, we have a, a, a database um, that the Assistant Superintendent's Office has put together that we, that we use, and then, the, um, you know, there's the data collection systems of our, our, of our coaches. But you need something more, a little bit more robust? Um, no, I think we just need to, um, I, I think that, you know, the turnover of data from one year to another can be a little tightened up. Um, what we have is working. And again, okay. these are systems and structures that we're building as far as, um, you know, now that we have ACE blocks, we have this dedicated time looking at, at data, um, having a reliable data sources to draw from that's common amongst all, you know, we're just one place where we can go and we can filter accordingly. Great. And then... The more general question, maybe for Dr. Holman, is so the narrowing of the achievement gap that he showed in in his slides, which is a different look than we've seen, is that similar across the district, or is it unique to Bishop, or we don't know yet? Do I think. Do you mean like the, that tr particular <coughs> trend? Yes. I would yeah. say at different schools where there are sometimes different focus areas because of what data stands out. So at Bishop, they focused on high needs. That's at least in part. High needs is sort of an aggregate subgroup. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. If we can get more specific at some schools, we can, we'll try to. I think you know they focus on high needs and EL because they have a significantly growing EL population. Other schools might focus on students who are identified as low income um, because that gap is wider or broader. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you're seeing is, what we're learning is that we wanna get more consistent about how we talk about the closure of gaps and which gaps it is that as a district we're trying to close and then schools might have specific ones that they're targeting in ACE block or in collaboration. Um, with other colleagues across departments, in part because that's the one that stands out, um, or because that's a population that's significant to that school. And we're, need we're going to be working on getting more consistent about how we report that out so that you're seeing a similar view across different school improvement plans, because you've seen a view, for example, at Dallin, of what it looks like in some of our Dibbles data. Um, you do get a mix, and I appreciate this from our teams, of MCAS and formative assessment data. Uh, we do that to indicate we're not just using MCAS, but we're also using some of these formative assessments and some of the trackers and screeners that they shared to demonstrate that. But yeah, there's certainly a plethora, and so getting more consistent about how we're showing closure of gaps is something we're working on. Great, thank you. Yeah. Ms. Morgan. I, I appreciated the sort of fidelity to the high needs mm -hmm. all student gap in this particular presentation because when you're seeing, a, like, I, I, I definitely knew what we were talking about. So I really, I appreciated that throughout both the written um, report and the slides. So thank you. That was good for me now. And if we pick different things in the future, it's just easier for me if they're all the same. <laughs> so thank you guys. Thank Thanks, you so Shane. much. Dr. Allison Ampey, are you okay? I just can't even see. I'm, I'm fine. Okay. Um, I appreciate, I agree with uh, Ms. Morgan. That was my uh, thing to say for this too. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much for all of your hard work and for being here. It's nice to see all of you in person. Same. Okay. Thank you very much. Good evening. Oh, Superintendent. Nice job. Sorry. <laughs> well done, especially with that high needs gap closure. Yeah. Awesome job, Bishop. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And the Hardy School, welcome. Thank you. It is so nice to be here in person. <laughs> We've been having that experience um, more and more as, uh, as things open up a little bit for us and our meetings. So um, 
Thank you for having us here this evening, everyone. I am Kate Peretz, the, the uh, proud principal of the Hardy, um, joined by Renee Nichols, who is one of our district librarians and a member of our instructional <coughs> leadership team. And Peggy Satsoulis is joining us on Zoom. Um, and I will be the lucky one who does all the talking this evening, but I do have my colleagues who are here to help um, support uh, with questions and comments after. Um, so at Hardy, um, we actually restarted our three-year uh, school improvement plan this year. So a lot of the things that you'll see in the school improvement plan as you look at it and here in the presentation are things that we have touched on in the past, um, but we've taken the feedback and really tried to make sure that it is as data-driven as it can be in order to help us tell the story that we'd like to tell. And what's really interesting to me is as I listen to um, my bracket colleagues and listen to my bishop colleagues and have conversations with um, our faculty, um, I've been you know, really lucky enough to be part of the strategic planning committees and I think that as we have these conversations about Arlington and the work that we're doing, we see a lot of common threads. And so it's almost like I could, you know, say ditto <laughs> when, we, when we're talking because we see that in our communities. Um, but at Hardy, uh, you know, we do have our um, own unique needs that come along with that. And so I will speak to Hardy specifically, but it's nice to know that we're all in this together and that we have some very common goals. Um, and I would like to say as an aside that I feel so very fortunate to be working on a team um, with principals, assistant principals, faculty um, that are so focused on really thinking about this work of equity and really looking at the way we have these gaps and that it's important to this community and to our educators. And I think that's something that I just, mm -hmm. I think we can't say enough. Um, and that we're not going to try to put forward a story that is, you know, glossy. Right, and that because we can look at a lot of our data and really think about the ways in which it shows great wins, but there are real things to work on in there. So at Hardy in the last few years, we have um, spent a lot of time recommitting ourselves to the words hand, mind, and heart with our entire community. Um, you've heard me say before that this is our vision and it's carved into the side of the building. It has been since 1925. Here we train hand, mind, and heart for the common good. We've been doing this work um, with the students in order to make that be more um, action focused or accessible to them. And we've taken hand, mind, and heart and we've translated it into the words safe, kind, and responsible. Um, and the work that we're doing with our students each day uh, reflect the ways in which they can be those things. Um, so our wins. The, uh, the establishment of the instructional leadership team, I think, is a huge thing for all of our schools this year. It's been very productive um, and really satisfying work thus far. Um, we're continuing to develop our teacher leadership opportunities at Hardy. We have a new culturally responsive teaching team, um, our PBIS, those positive behavior response teams, um, and working with our families and our school council, the PTO, and the DIGS and the DIG. Um, I think it's a real win that we're spending quite a lot of time looking at those formative assessments and we'll talk a lot about those as we go through the data and screeners um, in our academic areas, especially in the area of reading and in math. Um, and the Dibbles has already been touched on and I'll touch on that later as well. Um, we've made significant progress in Hardy in the development of different support systems for individuals' um, student needs as well as school-wide supports, and that's in the form of the PBIS. Um, the move to school-based coaching in ELA to join our school-based math coach is really um, an incredibly, uh, it's a gift to us that we have that. Um, and I think that we'll get to talking about MCAS as well, but it is a win that our MCAS measures, we do outperform the state in all ways. And at Hardy specifically, in the area of SEL, we are piloting the use of digital tools for second step social skills lessons in K through five. Um, and so, data tells a story. So that's what I wanna try to do this evening is tell the story at the Hardy and what we're thinking about. And so if we look at MCAS specifically, so here's a slide that is actually in addition to 
what was included in the school improvement plan um, that talks about science MCAS in grade five. And I think as we look at these measures through our school, through our district, comparing them to Massachusetts, you can see that we're doing very well. And so what I really want us to think about as we're going forward is what that means. Because we don't just want to, again, rest on those laurels. We want to continue to push ourselves forward to do better. Um, as we look at panorama data, I'll stay on this slide for now, that um, this is coming from 2021. And overall, as we think about um, the responses of our students and our families, we see that that social emotional response, that feeling of connection and belonging within our school is very high. Um, the percentage response, and these are just a few little snapshots, but I know you're all familiar with Panorama and you know that there's many, many questions. And as we go through those, we see that there are many areas in which we're doing very well. Um, however, there are challenges. And so I could say with MCAS that it's really an incredible thing that as we've gone through the last few years, we have been able to maintain that high above the state score overall. And that's pretty great, right? And so if we think about that, our teachers have really done an amazing amount of work um, and our community members and our students have worked very hard to support our schools in order to make sure we're maintaining those high standards. However, is it for everyone? And are we feeling those successes for everyone? You've heard that from my colleagues and it's true at Hardy as well, is that we continue to have a disproportionality in those summative assessment results um, for many of our cohorts. And those are the groups that we, in within the MCAS data, talk about as our high needs groups. Because of that, we continue to have a need for differentiation for all of our levels of learners. Um, and at the same time as we're trying to do those things, we face some real challenges, some real world challenges at Hardy and in Arlington, as we are across America and the world really, is that we have challenges in staffing, especially in the areas of special education, um, in, the, in those roles of paraprofessionals. And then we have daily challenges of coverage when staff members are absent and we don't have a reliable sub pool. We have rising mental health issues for all of the members of our communities of all ages. Um, and many of our families are also stressed and we see a decrease in connections with groups like PTO. And so um, I think that it's important as we're talking about goals and things that we're trying to put forward for our kids is that we keep that in mind is that the system needs to be working in positive ways to support the people who are part of that system. Um, and so as we look at the next slide, thinking about things like these measurements that are more summative, like the MCAS, you'll see that it continues to be those high needs groups that are below what we would like to see. Um, and that we're seeing that these are examples from 2019 to 2021 that you want to be able to look at that um, meeting or exceeding expectation as being the place where we're seeing that growth and not the growth happening in the areas where we are not meeting or partially meeting. And I think that's the real challenge right there. The other part that I want us to think about is as we look at the panorama data and we're thinking about the um, staff members that we have that have been working in our school that we do see that that sense of belonging information is lower. Um, how well do your colleagues at, at school understand you as a person? 40% responded favorably. How connected do you feel to other adults at your school? 47% responded favorably. Overall, how much do you feel like you belong at your school? 63% responded favorably. So this is coming from somewhere. And I think that in order to make sure that we're really supporting our students and our families and having a really uh, equitable uh, core education and a positive experience for everyone, all of our stakeholders, we need to pay attention to um, what's happening with our educators and how that has an impact on the learning of our students. So, Anyway, some of these things that I think we need to really focus on as priorities are things that you've heard already and we will um, work on at Hardy as well. 
So the implementation and specific focus on data-driven, differentiated instruction delivered in small groups and including explicit feedback and skill development to all students. So that is what we're talking about with the formative, is that we need to find these access points where our teachers can work with our kids to meet and give them the feedback and target that skill development wherever they may be, right? And so sometimes that might mean a year's worth of growth in a year's worth of time. Sometimes with that specific and targeted feedback and work in small groups, that might mean more than a year's worth of growth in a year's worth of time um, because the students are getting what they need. The use of student data in the area of social emotional learning in order to implement equitable evidence-based interventions that provoke, promote skill development in self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. Our students need the instruction in these skills. We're seeing at very young ages that students are, um, you know, having disruptions to their learning because of the skill development being delayed for whatever reason that might be. And so using programs like Second Step is a way to be able to target that need. A way to help the teachers to do that is using the digital tools that we're piloting at Hardy for the Second Step program, which is something we're really thankful to have and that the teachers are feeling like, here's something that I can really use to access this, um, which has been great. Uh, we also have as a priority the creation of an environment that consistently supports conversations about a recognition of diverse backgrounds, identities, and individual differences that actively and explicitly integrate the experiences of our students, faculty, and families. And I think this is something that we're really going to be thinking about over a longer term, over the next three years within this school improvement plan because in the panorama data, our instructional leadership team spent time looking at what were the answers to those specific questions that had to do with race and the conversation about race within our classrooms. And those percentages in Arlington and at Hardy, were, the answers were very low, very low, five, six percent. Um, and so in order to first get to that place in which that environment is created where we can have those conversations, we need to really focus to these pieces of identity and belonging and what that means to us. And so through our ILT, we have decided that we're going to spend time gathering information to help better understand and support what our community members believe when it comes to a sense of belonging. Because with our school council, we've also discovered that what that means to these different groups is very, very different. And even when we're talking about race and we're thinking about the experiences of um, the different members of our community and different racial groups, how that response, how that feels, what it means to belong is very, very different. Um, and staff, of course, and staff. So our action steps, it's the look at formative data. Um, it's the baseline data and what that will look like and providing an opportunity for each classroom teacher to be able to find the entry point for each one of our students. We'll be able to think about that and talk about that through our ACE block meetings and common planning times and we continue to be very thankful to have those ACE block times. Um, we're going to continue our focus on the practice of using responsive classroom which remains our primary um, approach to social emotional learning. The second step with the digital tools, our PBIS team, our culturally responsive teaching team. Um, we have a PBIS coach that we have through the MTSS Academy through DESE. We have a culturally responsive teaching coach. We meet with those coaches um, for two hours each month um, and they are helping to instruct and guide us. Um, the establishment of our instructional leadership team, of course, has been very helpful. Uh, developing the building-based faculty professional development with the ILT, with that focus on belonging, we're going to start with, um, you know, really doing questionnaires and pulling that information together and thinking about focus groups or em empathy interviews, which I know we've talked about before. 
um, and then really design the next steps that may include focus, those focus groups or empathy interviews to better understand the experience of our students and community members and answer the question, what does belonging mean to me? All right. Resources. Uh, I think our focus on staffing and our ability to attract and retain both professional and paraprofessional staff members is something that we all think about quite a lot here in Arlington. It needs to continue to be a focus um, and we need to continue to work on that together. We need to continue the development of partnerships between our coaches, our librarians, and other professional staff and general education classroom teachers. It has to do with teaming. It has to do with bringing all of these resources together because we do. We have a lot of really intelligent people on our teams and we need to find the way to improve the structures in which they work together. We'll continue to support the use of these digital tools in SEL lessons, including SEL coaches. We had an ACE meeting with one of our SEL coaches today in first grade. It was wonderful. Um, we need at Hardy specifically to continue the development of our special education programming at Hardy. We have an SLC that is transitioning from Bracket to Hardy and we're working with um, um, various, um, sorry, word finding problems right here at the end, it's getting <laughs> late, um, consultants um, to help us work on those structures and how to best make sure that we are um, doing our best work for those most um, of our, all of those students too. Continue to focus on differentiated professional development opportunities with all staff. This is what I was talking about with PDIS and Adaptive X. That's our, our culturally responsive teaching um, coach. That's their organization, Adaptive X. Um, and time for evaluation in the PD calendar for the core literacy program review and other responsibilities while we continue to work on school-based goals. It's a lot. It's a lot, and I think that um, with time and attention and working together, we can manage to move ourselves forward with our goals um, without overwhelming our system and without, um, you know, really <laughs> moving one of our groups forward at the, you know, the detriment of another, right? So I thank you for your time and attention. I hope you um, appreciate the story of the Hardy and the work that we're doing. I'm very, very proud of our school and our community. So thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Slickman. Okay. Um, Y'all doing well. Um, I, mean, I, I, I could say it's for, for all the schools. I mean, you know, w when I took a look at the MCAS scores on the academic side, there's a lot of high growth around the district, and you know Hardy's doing well. Uh, in talking to the, uh, to the bishop, they discussed the English language learner population, the L's. Uh, can you fill in a little more about where you are with being able to meet the needs of uh, English learners? Yes, absolutely. We're also lucky enough to have gone to two full-time EL teachers mm -hmm. at the beginning of this year, mm -hmm. which is great. It's help, very helpful. Um, we're looking at the structure of, of um, how to meet the needs of those students. And so between those two staff members, we've been thinking about the ways in which we can um, create a uh, caseload for them that mm -hmm. makes sense and a plan that makes sense that involves both the pullout that's necessary for those students who really are beginners mm -hmm. and need those separate classes mm -hmm. away from the classroom um, and then that push in that you've heard everyone talking mm -hmm. about because it's really also very interesting that the sense of belonging doesn't come when students are pulled from classrooms all Correct. the time, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and so we really need to mm -hmm. continue to support the work of that inclusion. So it's not just in uh, special education, it's not just in mm -hmm. EL, but it's in every area of what we do within mm -hmm. the classroom is that the students need to feel connected to the classrooms. So that push in with our EL teachers and all of our support people has been something that we've really been working on for the last several years at Hardy. Um, and so our two EL teachers have, re but, but caseload is important. So mm -hmm. what we discovered is that our 
younger grades were more heavily, um, the, the high, there were higher numbers of beginners in those mm -hmm. younger grades, yeah. which makes sense, mm -hmm. right? And so instead of having a, like a K to two model and a three to five model for the mm -hmm. teachers, what we've done is restructured their schedule in order to support you know, having an equitable number of beginners and you know, students who were functioning at a higher level and then having that balance of that pull out and that push in. So that, that overall structure has been something that's taken some time and we're still working on, but I think it's getting more um, time for kids in classrooms with their teachers. It sounds as if that this is sort of a common theme around the district, at least uh, in a couple of schools, that you're, we've now given you sufficient resources to meet standards for English learner instruction and now you're working through how to be most effective in terms of using those resources. That's right. Yeah. Because I think that the same, you know, the same old, same old kind of plans that we had in the past mm -hmm. just aren't cutting it anymore. Right? Yeah. And we really need to think about that and it's the same for the math interventionist like Stephanie was mm -hmm. talking about that's spending mm -hmm. more time pushing in with mm -hmm. the groups so that we can have the flexible groupings or the reading support that's at that grade level and we're working across as teams in our grade levels instead of individual teachers mm -hmm. trying to do the work of meeting the needs of all of those 24 students at the same time all by themselves. The, the one disappointment I have with your plan is there was a real lack of specificity in terms of student outcomes. You wrote the students will have a one year worth of growth at minimum from baseline in formative assessments. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly what we're looking for, but I, I, in, in an improvement plan, I'd sort of be looking for more guideposts of how to go and uh, where you're thinking and where your, your outcomes are. So for next year when you're developing the plan, I, I, I'd certainly like to see more focus for uh, some sort of a data marker for outcomes uh, that, that's tied to the work you're doing. Right. Thanks. And I think, yeah, thank you. Mm. Anybody else? Mr. Simmons? Great presentation. Good to see you. Mm. Ms. Peretz and I serve on the on Strategic Planning Committee number four, <laughs> the, the, which, which rocks. <laughs> I mean, really, it is the best one. I didn't, I didn't realize. It was number four. Yeah, he yeah. tells us this all the time. Yeah, I do. yeah it's well, a great committee. And the we bonded over the strategic yeah, plan. Yes, and the principal's very good at We've redirecting been. me, and it's really, really good at that. Like, no, we're on this part of the lesson now. <laughs> Sit up front. <laughs> My question, thank you very much, great presentation like all the others. My, my question for you, I, did, I, was, I appreciated your honesty in the challenges, and I'm kind of curious um, about, and I always like that when a leader just says, here are the challenges, here they are. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know about um, staffing. You said challenges in staffing, especially in the area of special education, the role of paraprofessionals. How are you on staffing? Are you fully staffed? Are there vacancies now? Uh, we st we've made progress, but yeah. we definitely still have vacancies, and it's been a real challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I really do appreciate um, the support that's given with trying to make sure that we're maintaining um, those staffing levels, but also having a high quality of, of staff member, yeah. you know, because I think that it's, it's just times have just changed. You know, we have... In the past, our paraprofessionals were people who were certified teachers who were trying to get their foot in their door because mm -hmm. a teaching job was a really hard thing to get, yeah. especially in a district like Arlington. Mm -hmm. And now what we're finding is that uh, we don't have that pool. I think it's still, we still do better with um, those certified jobs, right? So we still have a lot of applicants when we're trying to do classroom general, you know, general educators. Um, but it's harder in the field of special education and also those people who are applying, if they are even applying for those jobs of paraprofessionals, are people who don't have training. And so it's a real challenge mm -hmm. um, in order to, it, or it's a, diff it's a different challenge, yeah. I should say, than we've had in the past. And mm -hmm. I think we were very lucky, you know, if you have these paraprofessionals who are teachers, it makes a big difference than someone who's coming in and we're very happy to have them, but we need to support them on what it means to be a person who works in a school. And sometimes we really are starting with the very basics. Um, so it's. Got it. Yeah. And I know we're using search firm. Aren't we using a search firm for some of this stuff? Or we've searched through. We're using uh, 
sort of an outplacement. Outplacement, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. But the, yeah, to sort of a outsourcing some of it when we can. Uh, and, but I mean, we're trying still to hire, and we, we're gonna talk a little bit about that later, but yeah, we're still yeah, trying okay. to hire people directly. That's our preference. Yeah, yeah, no, obviously, obviously. Okay. But as, as, a, as, a, as a, some support for the process is what you, all right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, I, similar to Mr. Schlickman, I, as a classroom teacher, appreciate the sort of choice in initiative one, but at the same time, um, I, I, I'm sort of concerned about the open-endedness of it. I feel like a focus across the school, um, you know, allows teachers to collaborate, PD can be coordinated, um, it can give sort of a direction to, um, to conversations and things like that. So I, I also looked at that and um, was a little concerned about um, its open-endedness, I guess. Yeah, and so I guess I, I, I would like to comment on that just a little bit to let you into our thinking as a community about it. And so, you know, it's important to, I know you know this, but I'll, you know, we have our district goals, we create our school improvement plan and what our goals are, but then the teachers have their goals that they're working on. Mm -hmm. And so to us, we're empowering our teachers to make choices about what it is they're working on every day. And so as I work and as um, Ms. Satsoulis works together as um, the supervisors of our educators at the different grade levels, we've worked to create this joint goal with the teachers, but wanted to give them the choice to be able to find those places to get into that, right? So some are working on literacy, some are working on math, some are working on social emotional learning, and the measurements we are using are the measurements that we use throughout the district. We're using Dibbles, we're using iReady, we're using the math screeners that Emily was talking about. We're using um, the panorama, but we're also using the elements that you find for assessment within the second step curriculum. So each one of these things has a measurement and we have a baseline and each of the teachers knows and we're working on the eight, uh, during ACE blocks about what those baseline measurements are and where we wanna go. But in my mind, in our mind, that's the place where we can find the equity in our, in our instruction, only when we look at that individual <coughs> data at the student level and that the teachers are really connected to it and that there's a piece of them being able to make those decisions based on the students that they have in front of them every day. So that's the thinking behind that. Thank you. Can I ask Thank a question? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna put you on the spot, I'm sorry Ms. Nichols, but uh, as a member of the Hardy ILT, I'm curious if you could share with us a little bit about what that experience has been like. Um, well, for me, I'm brand new to the Hardy this year, so I don't know if we're on like week nine or 10. Um, <laughs> and um, you put me on the Dallin ILT team at the leadership committee, <laughs> so I've also been some, somewhat um, working with them as well. It's, it's a really great experience. Um, especially being brand new to the school, it's given me a way to connect with other educators. It's given me a way to begin conversations with the math coaches and with the ELA coaches who are also on the team. Um, it's great to hear the teachers talk about their students and what they're noticing as we're looking at the data. And um, most of them, you know, they've been there for years and they, they know these students as more than just these numbers on the paper. And so, it's been helpful for me to hear to hear their stories and to hear um, what they're trying to do with their students in terms of how they're trying to improve instruction and, and accommodate all learners. Um, the area of belonging and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is very near and dear to my heart. So I'm always listening out for ways that I can can kind of insert what I know and what I would love to do with them in their classrooms. But I think. Um, uh, for me, in, in a new role as well, the librarian position being stationed at any schools is brand new this year, and um, finding those ways to connect in the ILT and also look at what the school goals are and what the data is that informs those has been really helpful. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you and your colleagues from the library team on our leadership teams. Thank you. Thank you. And nice job, Hardy. Well done. Thank you very much.
Mr. Swickman, sorry. I, I'd, li I'd like to ask the superintendent a question that came up in, in Mr. Thielman's questioning, mm -hmm. uh, that if we are bringing in new people as paras who don't have that connection to schools, uh, one of the things that I've seen in my professional practice is that teachers learn how to work with kids, but not necessarily with other adults in the classroom. What are we, I, I, I don't want to ask what are we doing, but what are our thoughts about supporting teachers in their work with other adults that they're responsible for, mm -hmm. such as a power or somebody who's coming in who is not a, a, a licensed educator, who's a support person within their classroom. Are, are we thinking about that? Are we doing anything with that? Uh, is, is that something on the radar? I would say I'm sure it is for our professionals at the school level. Mm -hmm. at, a, at a district level, I think the conversation we were just having highlights a need that I have certainly heard from educators, which mm -hmm. is that we need to think about how we're supporting our paraprofessionals when they come into the district. And you raise a good point that that also means supporting our teachers who are working directly with those paraprofessionals. I've been in settings where there's a very specific focus on effective use of teaching assistants in the mm -hmm. classroom. Um, it has not been the professional development focus at the district level for us this year because we've been redesigning mm -hmm. some other things relative mm -hmm. to PD. Um, but it's certainly cropping up as a need, particularly as we see this trend emerging where the expertise our paraprofessionals enter with is different than it has been in the past. I know one of the, th the strengths that you're trying to build into our PD is to give teachers choice for things they feel ne they need. And this might be something to explore. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Hardy, for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there. <laughs> um, Mo and Tamaki and um, Amy. Amy, if you need to go, you are welcome to leave. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank Have you. A good night. Have a good night. All right. Dr. McNeil. Thank you. Discipline report. Your mic. Oh, your mic. oh, oh. sorry. Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I know, I know. So I'll say that again for our millions of listeners. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I have two slide decks in Novus. One is the presentation slide deck, and the other one is the slide deck that that's, has a little bit more information. So we wanted to keep it kind of succinct on the presentation for tonight, and then I will also respond to any questions that you have. I wouldn't use that. You're going to want to use the arrow. Okay, so here we go. So, this I guess this is. Yes, take it. I already gave it to you. <laughs> All right, I'm organized now. Okay, so um, the, the presentation tonight will include discipl disciplinary outcomes by the elementary level and uh, at each secondary school. And it will include out of school suspensions and in school suspensions. And we have uh, disaggregated the data by ethnicity, race, gender, and IEP status. And then we can talk about district wide steps, things, themes that each school or at each level that uh, we're doing in order to support behavior. And then we'll open it up for questions and comments. So we'll start off at Arlington High School. Um, this is the raw data, so last year, and this, I also want to emphasize that the discipline data that I am presenting is from last school year, so FY22. And so there's, there were 12 students who were received out of school suspensions at the high school, and as you can see the breakdown there, five were males, seven were females, and then you see the percentages for how many students were on an IEP, 
and then you see the percentages for the different uh, race and ethnicity. And then looking down at bullet number five, you'll see some of the biggest reasons for the out-of-school suspensions were drugs, fight, assault, uh, fighting assault, theft, chronic behavior such as uh, absenteeism, and we had a student that was charged with a felony. So moving to our in-school suspension data, there are 26 students who received in-school suspensions, 15 were males, 11 were females, and you'll see the percentage bre breakdown by IEP status and race and ethnicity. Next, we have Addison Middle School. Again, uh, we have the out-of-school suspension data for Addison Middle School, and I will have to check on this because I did speak to Principal Maringer, <coughs> and I think I have, we have to adjust <coughs> that 21 students who were suspended. So um, I am going to check on that, so I just want to point that out. Uh, but the data that I have, we went through the different incidents, and right now we have 21 students who were suspended, 16 were male, 5 were female. You'll see the IEP status breakdown by the percentage of students who have an IEP, the race and ethnic ethnicity percentages, and some of the biggest reasons for those uh, out-of-school suspensions were vandalism, physical, and physical altercations. And then for our in-school suspension, you'll see we had 23 students 23 students who received in-school suspensions at Addison last year. 17 were males, 6 were females. You'll see the percentages break down for students who are on an IEP and for race and ethnicity. And then at Gibbs, we had 5 students who, were out of, who received an out-of-school suspension. 5 were male. Um, we didn't have any students who, were f who identified as female. And you'll see the percentages for breakdown for the IEP status and for race and ethnicity. And some of the biggest reasons for the out-of-school suspensions were bullying and uh, threatening behavior or language. And then at the elementary level, we had one student uh, district-wide who received an in-school suspension. And I didn't provide any additional demographic information because I didn't want to <coughs> identify that student. So looking at overall, just district-wide, um, looking at the data overall, we have at the secondary level, it shows that uh, students from the following groups uh, are more likely to receive an out-of-school or in-school suspension, and those are students who are on an IEP and students who identify as black, African-American, or Hispanic, Latino. And a majority of our suspensions are in-school suspensions. And as you can see from the school improvement presentations today, some of the things that we're doing at all schools across the district to support behavior is we continue to train staff on alternative approaches to discipline, review and implement strategic recommendations for our most recent equity audit to promote engagement and belonging, continue to support the work of school counselors, social workers, and district-wide social, social and emotional coaches uh, to create tools and strategies to teach all students how to fully engage in learning, continue to offer anti-racist, unconscious bias training to all staff through district-wide professional development sessions and our ideas courses, continue to administer, collect, and analyze data from our mental health screener and our culture and, culture and climate surveys to understand how to best support students in their respective learning environments, and continue to implement explicit social and emotional curriculum at each level. So I will open it up for questions and comments at this Anybody? Yeah. Dr. Allison Ampey, did you? She, she has a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. McNeil, for the presentation. Um, I had a couple questions. First, I want to say I appreciate having the breakdown in terms of IEP versus not. I am concerned about the over-representation of uh, students who have IEPs in terms of being suspended either in school or out of school and continue to be concerned whether this means there's something we need to be doing differently with our special education students. Um, either we need, they need more supervision or something, something feels not right. Um, so that's, one thing, um, 
I know last year we had seen detention data for at least Audison, and I kind of thought we were going to, we were hoping to see that again um, for all the schools. I mean, at least the like give uh, secondary schools. Um, and I just wondered about that too. So um, I can definitely uh, produce some data as it relates to that. Uh, I can speak with the secondary principals. I know that at Gibbs, they do, they do not have detention, and at elementary, we do not have detention. So I will have to discuss that with our high school, uh, uh, Dr. Janger and, and Mr. Maringer at the Odyssey. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I, can I just add to the point about um, some of the discrepancy you see in particular with, as it relates to students with IEPs? I do think that is worth us reflecting on the environment for our students with IEPs. And I also think it's important for us to think about um, how we, the, the environment that we as adults are creating for our students with IEPs and how our practices when it comes to things like de-escalation or our own biases as it relates to our students' needs with IEPs uh, come into play there. So we are planning on doing some um, training around disciplinary practices with our administrative team later on this spring. We're both going to do regulatory training around um, bullying law and then do follow-up uh, conversations with staff about situations that warrant uh, drastic disciplinary measures like suspension and when you can use other means of helping students learn from their actions that aren't disciplinary. So I, I, I think that it's a yes to what you said, Dr. Alice Nampi, and an and that you know we need to learn other strategies that will help us avoid situations where our students who have IEPs are in situations where they're disciplined. So. I would like to add That's on that. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Yep. And we've already started those conversations mm -hmm. about the different situations uh, when we are implementing our discipline policy. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, I will say also it's all, all district staff or all instructional yeah. staff that we need to have that conversation with. And it's more, it's not just uh, staff who are our special educators. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shuckman. Do you know if the students with IEPs that are running into suspension issues are coming in with IEPs that have elements that revolve around uh, conduct or, or uh, working, working, being around others? Uh, you understand what I'm saying? I do. I have. I. I did not go through the data to look at the specific IEP goals mm -hmm. or why a student has a, 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 we haven't made that correlation mm -hmm. I think that I, I would go back and echo uh, what Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Holman just articulated that mm -hmm. looking at the environment mm -hmm. for all of our students looking at the uh, looking at unconscious bias and how we're treating mm -hmm. our students who are on an IEP mm -hmm. in relation to how we treat our students who are not on an IEP. Mm -hmm. I think looking at it from that aspect and understanding how to support students and looking at our strategies and practices mm -hmm. and not really looking at the student and seeing like what we, we need mm -hmm. to look at our actions and our instructional practice and how we're supporting those students. Mm -hmm. And so it's more reflecting on our behavior than rather than looking at the different it is in relation to what the needs are of the students, but looking at our practices and how we're supporting those students so that they're going to be successful. And perhaps going back into the IEP and looking to see if there are adjustments to be made that in, in the way that we're uh, interacting with their disability. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm alluding to, like mm -hmm. our, how we're I interacting mm -hmm. with those students and supporting them. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Next, we have uh, the superintendent evaluation for Dr. Holman. Um, so I, so just for for the, those watching, um, so the summative evaluation is the public evaluation of the superintendent. Uh, the superintendent has only one evaluator, the committee as a whole, and therefore has one evaluation. So this um, evaluation that's in Novus 
um, is intended to provide feedback will, that will help the superintendent know where the committee believes the superintendent has been sex successful and where improvement may be warranted. And so committee members um, shared their individual um, evaluations with me and I worked to create a composite evaluation and then I shared both the individual evaluations and the composite evaluation with Dr. Homan. So I'm going to start by uh, sh going through briefly the composite evaluation and then if there are committee members who feel like something is missing or they'd like to add something from their individual um, evaluations, we can have a conversation <coughs> about that. Um, so I'm going to try to make this quick, but um, based on the feedback from the committee members, Dr. Homan um, met her professional practice goals, the student learning goal, and the district improvement goal. Um, and she w um, received a proficient rating for standard one instructional leadership, a standard, a proficient rating for standard two management and operations, a proficient rating for standard three family and community engagement, and a proficient rating for standard four professional culture. And so our overall summative performance rating of Dr. Holman is proficient. Thank you very much, Dr. Holman. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read these comments as our composite, and then if people want to add something. Yeah. The Arlington School Committee would like to congratulate Dr. Holman on a strong start in her role as superintendent of the Arlington Public Schools. Dr. Homan has established herself as an impactful instructional leader with a thoughtful, inclusive approach to budget development and family and community engagement. Notable achievements of Dr. Homan's first year of superintendency include the return to school plan, new district vision, mission, and strategic priorities, a revised values-based budget process, and improved transparency and consistency of school improvement plans. Community outreach, increased stakeholder engagement, and developing common language around teaching and learning were goals Dr. Homan set for herself. The committee saw progress in all of these areas and would like to see Dr. Homan's model for broader two-way communication expanded across the district and throughout leadership teams. The committee recognizes Dr. Homan's approachability, communication skills, and commitment to the academic and social-emotional well-being of students as strengths. Dr. Homan welcomes feedback from the committee and the community, both in formal and informal settings. She is a strong communicator who shares information clearly with data to back up decision making. Moving forward, the committee would like to see the same levels of transparency and communication consistently across the district. It is noteworthy that fiscal year 23 was Dr. Homan's first time leading a budget cycle. As in other areas of her work, she implemented a comprehensive and collaborative budget process with her cabinet team, curriculum leaders, and leadership teams, while keeping the needs of students at the forefront. At the same time, there were some areas of challenge, partially due to COVID, around communication and incorporation of feedback from all stakeholders. The committee recognizes that the superintendent has reflected on this and will make adjustments going forward. In conclusion, the school committee commends the superintendent for her accomplishments and looks forward to working together to build upon her successful first year in Arlington. So I am not going to read all the sub <laughs> goals, but there are comments in there um, as a committee that I tried to incorporate, but others um, had shared. So I don't, if, at this point, if there are committee members would like to add anything. Dr. Allison Ampier, I can't even see her. Yeah. No, I'm good, thank okay. you. All right. Do we need to vote on Mr. Sussman, I'm looking at you. Uh, we can, uh, uh, we can move, move acceptance. We receive, yeah. okay. move down. Uh, I move we receive the evaluation. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Slickman, seconded by Mr. Thielman to receive um, the superintendent's evaluation roll call vote. Mr. Oh, discussion. <laughs> Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Thank you very much, Dr. Holman. It's been a great 14 months. We appreciate your hard work. <laughs> thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to the committee members for your very thorough and thoughtful feedback. I know how time consuming it is to work through this rubric and with this rubric and to provide feedback on each indicator area. Um, and 
I have valued the feedback not only from the evaluation but also the feedback I get from each of you as we do our work together and the collaboration of this committee. It's really been a wonderful 14, 15, 16 months, however long I've been here now. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate each of you and how much um, detail and thought you put into this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Got some job descriptions. Uh, to approve. So we'll start with the Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Operations. Okay. So you have a job description for Superintendent, uh, Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Operations, which is the role that Mr. Mason will assume on January 1st. Uh, it is similar to the role of the job description of CFO with adjustments in supervisory capacity for the role and a few adjustments in um, membership that we would expect this person to maintain because there's a little more flexibility. Uh, we, of course, want them to maintain membership in some of the financial school finance organizations, but also in Mass Association of School Superintendents. If you have any questions about this one, I'm happy to answer them. Questions, comments? Motion to approve. Got him. I, 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 oh, sorry, thank you. Dr. Allison Del Go ahead, Dr. Allison Ambie. Okay, um, just budget met last week and we reviewed the draft um, CFO job description and made a couple edits and then uh, moved to recommend the approval of the job description to the full committee. So that's all. Mm -hmm. And the, the one that's in here is the one that has the edits? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Okay. A motion? So moved. Uh, second. Motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. Discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have the deputy, sorry, now I've lost it, deputy superintendent. <laughs> teaching and learning. Okay, so this is a job description for the replacement role when Dr. McNeil sadly leaves our team. Um, we would like to post this as soon as he has an agreed upon contract. It is an adjustment in title, um, a slight one, from curriculum and instruction to teaching and learning. That's um, a cast that a lot of areas have put on this role. Um, it's a sort of more descriptive and straightforward way of describing what the role is about. It's about teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. um, and the instead of assistant superintendent, it is listed as deputy. I did some thinking about whether I wanted that deputization to be something a little more flexible. Uh, in thinking about it, uh, I do want this role to be the second in command role sort of structurally in the system. And so that deputy <clears throat> is intended to signal that that's the second in command and sort of my uh, or the assist or the superintendent thought partner when it comes to leading the district. Um, and of course, mm -hmm. there's there we work as a team. There's thought mm -hmm. partnership across all members of our cabinet team. Um, but that deputy is meant to signal that that is the second in command in the event that I am out or there needs to be an acting superintendent. We've also sort of reformatted elements of the job description to make it more concise. Um, there were elements in the old job description that were sort of repetitive as you moved through performance responsibilities. Uh, we didn't adjust minimum qualifications except to say that there would be a minimum of five years teaching experience in teaching, and it used to say uh, K-12 school or district administration preferred, and now um, the minimum qualification is that there is that five years of uh, K-12 school or district administration experience. So those are the major adjustments to this. Ms. Morgan. We talked about this mm -hmm. at CIA on Monday. Given some time constraints, we did not vote on it, um, but our lack of recommendation does not um, indicate a lack of, I, I, well, anyway, we didn't vote on it, um, but here we are. Mr. Schlickman. I, I value the discussion we had in the CIA subcommittee because we raised the question of whether the deputy position would be floating or tied to a position, and I'm glad that the superintendent was reflective about it, and I'm very happy to support her uh, decision within the structure. Uh, a move approval. Is there a second? I'll second it. We have a motion by Mr. Slickman, seconded by Mr. Thielman. Any more discussion? Poor, I can't mm -hmm. see Dr. Allison Ampey there. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Slickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Um, superintendent's update. All right. Dr. Holman. 
So, hold on, I need my notes on this. Um, I have, I updated the slides today in your materials from what you had originally gotten um, because we had a few additional updates that we added in. Um, so you might want to take a look if you haven't had a chance to. Uh, for strategic planning updates, we have conducted two community forums. We did one just last night in Boston. It was great fun. Mr. Thielman attended. Um, and we were at METCO headquarters and it was great to meet a couple of our families who are Boston residents. Um, we have two coming up. One is in person at Arlington High School. One is virtual. And we are also um, in the process, uh, well, we collected staff feedback on the no November 8th Professional Development Day. We gave uh, staff considerable time in breakout sessions to take a deep dive into one priority area and provide feedback, which the teams took a look at and used to further refine their initiatives over the last couple weeks. Um, we are conducting student empathy interviews. Those are just getting started. And they'll be, we're sort of using the PE wellness department to help organize this because that's one of the department that really hits sort of all of the kids. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll be conducting some empathy interviews with students asking questions that are sort of targeted around each priority area but that are very student friendly, asking them about their experiences and what they would like to see improve about their experiences at school in each of the four priority areas. Um, we gave you initiative overview documents in your school committee materials. Um, if they're not in your materials for tonight, they are in the materials for CIAA subcommittee um, that was just held on Monday and had a chance to look over those and get some feedback. I appreciated feedback in CIAA the other day that helped us sort of identify places where we might have gotten a little too granular and could mm -hmm. pull up a bit. Um, we shared that with the committee the following evening and it's it, they were, I think, relieved in some ways to hear that they could pull up a little and give some more flexibility of implementation in how they articulate the initiatives. Um, our timeline right now is that initial drafts were submitted on Monday and those are currently being refined. Really, they're being re refined by our consultant, Dan Anderson, and then I'm going to look over them next. Uh, we're going to start the process of attaching um, financials to the initiatives uh, over a course of five years and we'll have those drafts done in December. Those drafts will be reviewed and further refined by the planning teams in December, integrating some more of the feedback from stakeholders and from our empathy interviews with students. Uh, we'll be generating that year-to-year -year cost out and that'll be happening right as we're working on FY24 budget proposals and the final plan should be completed and shared um, in January. So that's where we're at, we're moving right along. Um, some additional updates, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE's local spe special education determination came in this week under Part B of IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and I wanted to update you that we were found to meet requirements and earned almost all of the points awarded, 28 out of 30. Uh, also, we did our tiered focus monitoring site visits this week. Uh, shout out to Ms. Elmer, who has been deeply involved in all of that. Um, areas of review tied to special education during tiered focus monitoring include student assessments, determination of eligibility, the IEP team process, IEP development and implementation. Um, and we also had areas of review related to civil rights, including bullying, student discipline, physical restraint, and access to school programs for all students. They conducted uh, interviews this week with district staff and administrators, reviewed student records, conducted on-site observations at a couple of our schools, and they also interviewed the chairpersons of the CPAC um, and other caregivers as part of their on-site visit. So um, congratulations to Ms. Elmer for the coordination and successful completion of that. We had our exit interview with them today and they shared some trends with us and we're overall very uh, positive about some of the work that we're doing in our schools. We look forward to sharing their final report with you when it comes in. Uh, Ms. Elmer, anything you want to add to that? Um, no, I actually, I turned on my camera because you handled it pretty quickly and well, so I don't have anything to add. Mm -hmm. Just Great. thanks to the staff and the families who participated. Um, we did have, you know, relatively um, good response rate to the surveys um, that uh, were sent out to each family of a student with an IEP. Um, and like you mentioned, you know, our entire department, you know, over the last year, um, has done a lot to prepare for this, both through the self-assessment and now the on-site visit. So I want to just thank the folks who participated in the interviews, helped with the record reviews, uploaded data, et cetera. Thank you. All right. Um, we had a very successful November 8th Professional Development Day. Um, Dr. McNeil and uh, Ms. Thomas put together a spectacular program for us in collaboration with many, many others. 
Uh, it started out with a first a performance of uh, music, uh, staff musicians um, doing a performance of music by Price is the last name. What's the first name of the musician? Florence, Florence Price, um, who is a black uh, musician, a composer, whose work was very uncelebrated during her life. And so there was a, a piece by the musicians and a slideshow that talked about the experiences that she had had throughout her life trying to get her music recognized and some of the obstacles that she had faced. Um, when the performance was done, we had a staff panel of staff sharing their experiences and what they thought belonging looked like as staff members in APS that was very powerful. Um, we did our launch of our literacy review process uh, in the afternoon. All of our el elementary educators were in the auditorium and learned about what the process would be for vertical teaming and taking a look at our literacy resources sources, which was a great use of the day. Um, again, back in the morning, we had staff look at the uh, strategic initiatives and provide us feedback on that, which was a good use of time too. And there was a 200 foot sub, sub sandwich from D'Agostino's um, that was great fun and a little silly, and we really enjoyed it. Uh, it was to benefit Food Link, which was fantastic. It was a really great cause for us to support uh, in partnership with D'Agostino's, which is you know a restaurant we all fondly go to on a regular basis. Uh, they also passed out uh, $1 coupons for our teachers to go back if they wanted to, so that was nice of them. Um, I wanted to share that our uh, Massachusetts School Wellness Advisory Council applied for and was chosen as one of the 15 districts in Massachusetts to get the assistance of a wellness coach from the Mass School Wellness uh, Coaching Program. The wellness coach will assist the council in reviewing our district wellness policy and provide guidance as we make updates to that and ensure it complies with state and federal standards. And so if we need to make updates to that policy, we'll certainly be in touch with uh, Mr. Schlickman and we're looking forward to hearing how that process goes with the wellness committee, which I believe mm -hmm. you sit on as well too. Mm -hmm. so, all right. um, we are in the process of planning for an overnight experience. We discussed this with the Gibbs staff on uh, November 8th as part of their building time in the afternoon. It's possible that we might be able to use some of this time if we do it with sixth grade uh, for staff to support the transition into sixth grade. So we're trying to really think about if students are out of the building for some number of days and some staff go and some staff stay back, how can we use this time to support planning and transition um, or other efforts at our sixth grade school? We do plan to work with Nature's Classroom due to capacity and services. We are looking at next school year to give the Gibbs staff plenty of time to plan for this um, and be purposeful about it. And we are in the process of getting agreements from Nature's Classroom so that we can understand what the cost implications are going to be, uh, think about what students might need so that we can support any of those needs that they might have, figure out a system for supporting any students who might not be able to financially support going. Um, and make sure that we feel good about the supervision that would happen overnight because we would plan to use their overnight services in order to support this effort. Uh, they also have an on-site nurse, which is one of the reasons why this program was the one that we were willing to consider. Um, playground update, Bishop and Stratton are open, which is very exciting. Uh, Pierce <coughs> inspection is scheduled for the 23rd and opening is targeted for the 28th of November. Um, you, we just approved the um, uh, job description for assistant superintendent, well, deputy superintendent of teaching and learning now. Um, and we will, as soon as we are able to post it, start the process of putting together an initial search team. Uh, there will be a call for community members to participate in that, for students to participate in it, as well as staff members, members of our administrative team. So be on the lookout for that. And I'm happy to share more details as we start moving through the process. Uh, we do seek to have a very inclusive process to have forums and a finalist round and finalist tasks as well. Uh, so it will be lengthy. My um, guess at the moment is that we would post it through December and then start the actual interview process um, in, the new, in the new year so that we have plenty of time to gather applications. Uh, we did want to give you, your enrollments are in your materials and I wanted uh, to have Mr. Spiegel give you a vacancies update. Thank you. So uh, currently, um, I think as of next week, we'll have 6.6 um, .6 vacancies in unit A positions, um, which include um, school nurses, um, two school nurses, uh, I think three special ed teachers uh, in different schools, um, one phys ed teacher, um, and a 0.6 speech language pathologist who are um, 
there's some res that's a resignation that is hasn't taken effect yet, but is is will take effect at the end of the month, um, and so we need to replace that position. Um, the nurses, I will say, are being covered. The the vacancies in nurses are being covered by uh, substitutes and resource nurses. So we do have coverage for nurses, but we do have um, a couple full time vacancies that we are still looking to fill. And then as um, Ms. Parrott's kind of alluded to, the biggest um, number of vacancies for people who are working with students in the district are in the paraprofessionals. Um, and it's been hard to fully staff most of our schools with paraprofessionals. And um, there's, you know, schools have one to, um, I think, uh, to four vacancies in paraprofessionals. So most schools have two or three uh, vacancies. Um, and we are still looking to fill. We have engaged, um, so I would say about 19 paraprofessionals district-wide that we are, that are vacant. Um, and we also have some vacancies in some of our uh, custodial services and facilities um, and uh, crossing guard and um, some food service. So there's different support areas that we can still use. We can use, still use more um, help for um, coverage when there's needs uh, for substitute coverage for our daycare. So there's different areas where we, we could use some, some help. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we are trying to fill positions directly and hire people, and the pools are not as, as great as they used to be, and um, the level of experience, as Ms. Parrott said, is not the same for the paraprofessionals right now. And we are engaging with a, a few staffing agencies, um, one that we use primarily, um, who will, um, we contract with the staffing agency and they will provide, if they can, uh, also staff the positions, um, either teachers, we've, we've used a couple teachers, and uh, paraprofessionals. Um, but our, we're still looking and our first priority is to fill the positions directly. Questions or comments from the committee? I'd, I'd want to note that for the nursing positions, um, they are also at schools that have an additional right. professional nurse. So um, Audison Middle School and AHS are where the two vacancies are. <coughs> Those two schools are the schools that have more than one nurse at that school. Um, so we are filling those vacancies. Yes, with there's no school that's not covered. There's no school that's without a professional nurse that's one yes. of our employees. Mm -hmm. okay. Consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 23091 in the amount of $982,414.81, dated November 1st, 2022. Warrant number 23104 in the amount of 680000 $386.71 stated November 15th, 2022. School committee meeting minutes October 27th, 2022. Would someone like to move approval? So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. Roll call vote, Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes, that's unanimous. Subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. So we met on the 8th. <coughs> we discussed the end of year um, review, the FY23 budget, the FY3, uh, FY24 budget and process, um, ESSER 3, and program fees, and also the CFO job description. Um, the for the FY24 budget, I just realized I don't think we've sent you the calendar. We don't feel it needs to be approved by the committee, by the full committee, but uh, we, we feel it actually belongs with the superintendent. But I meant to have that shared with you so that you're aware. So we'll, we can just send that, have, I'll ask Ms. Diggins to send that out for us. But in terms of the fee, program fees, after reviewing the program fees structure, uh, we made a motion to forward the fee structure as presented and as is in the found in Novus to the full school committee for approval. Um, so that is 
Uh, so I move approval of the fee structure as presented, uh, the fees for 2022-23. Wait a second. I'll, I'll second. Second. We have a motion by Dr. Allison Ambi, seconded by Mr. Thielman. Discussion? Uh, I didn't see a marker on here, so I didn't look in here for, for content. So I have, this is the first I'm seeing it. Yeah, we had, we had approved, so, yeah, we had approved most of these fees. In the, in the spring. In the spring. And, and we're we were added, there were some that were missing that were added for the middle school middle school classrooms and gym right mm -hmm. and then placeholders for the high, high school, school. Is still, is still not, not in here oh it's not okay middle school no they're tbd the high, high school right. cafeteria oh, and gym okay, yeah yeah, yeah. The, the, the numbers aren't ah. in here yeah sorry there were some administrative problems getting it posted um so i'm sorry that you didn't see it before yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't peek in that that slot in the uh, Novus uh, because the little yeah. indicator okay. wasn't on. But I'm I'm cool with this. Fine. We, yeah. we have a motion by Dr. Allison and be seconded by Mr. Thielman. Roll call vote. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. <clears throat> yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Absolutely. Ms. Morgan. The the daily before school rate on here is fifteen dollars a day. I thought we had gone we'd move that down on the one we just approved. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, we did move that down because we changed the structure. We didn't stop the structure. So do we want to Do we want? Do we do, do we, we know want? the number? Can we find out the number? Could we we could keep discussing and come back to this? While you look it up. All right, can, Ms. Morgan, would you? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so, do we want to? So, I move that the before school fee be adjusted to nine dollars. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Cardin, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. Discussion. Roll call vote. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Okay. Um, Community relations, Mr. Hainer is not here. Mr. Carter, did you want to say anything about this? Yes, yeah, so do, do should the chat minutes be put in Novus? They, they're not, but um, so we had a, the chat this weekend with the special education focus. Um, there were four or five parents at, on during the, the half hour that we were there. Um, nothing of, of huge concern, but um, we'll share the minutes. Uh, curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Ms. Morgan. Uh, we met on Monday. We had a really good conversation about um, SLC and special education programming at Gibbs. We talked about the uh, strategic planning. We talked about the overnight experience. And we talked about the um, deputy superintendent job description. We are meeting again in December for what I call in my mind HS day um, but more specifically we are talking about um, the an, an HDI update I think with just some of the pieces that we didn't that weren't part of the October update we're talking about open campus and substitutes at HS and strategic planning and that is on December 21st Thank you. Facilities, Mr. Thielman? Yes, the, so our subcommittee met yesterday afternoon and uh, there is a, an interest in the part of um, 
the Greek church uh, in, in acquiring 3,000 square feet of space uh, that is near the church that is owned by the Arlington Public Schools in Town Council Doug Hyam walked us through the process to respond to that request and we um, uh, need more information. So we need more information on what the, what the church wants to do. And it's a process that involves a review by our subcommittee, a consultation with the state because the, the, the bill, which I don't think is gonna mean, amount to much because the building uh, was funded with uh, state funds, some of the reconstruction. Um, a vote of the full school committee, a vote of town meeting, um, and then an open bidding process, an appraisal and an open bidding process. So I'm not sure what's gonna happen. We just had a preliminary meeting to learn more. We're at the beginning stages of the conversation. We'll report back. Thank you. Policy and procedures, Mr. Schlickman. We will be meeting next Monday at 2 p.m. We have a full agenda. We have a plethora of minor adjustments to several non-discrimination policies to amend the footnotes and references pertaining to the Crown Act. Um, we'll also be discussing electric vehicle charging stations, agenda format, preparation dissemination, public comment, and guidelines for same as the policy and our practice have diverged with the, the Zoom uh, meeting. So we're gonna try to get it back to where our policy aligns to our practice. Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Simmons. We meet next on December, I don't know what that is, whatever, the first Tuesday in December. No, no, nothing really major to report. Superintendent evaluation, Mr. Cardin. Uh, I think we're done for now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well done. Thank you for your work there. Uh, liaison reports, Ms. Morgan. Um, as Dr. Homan said, we um, have a consultant for the Wellness Committee, which is great. We have spent a lot of time. Um, we met this week. Uh, it's possible it was just yesterday. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think it was. Okay, anyway, um, there are very substantive changes to the wellness policy that are coming. I'm actually gonna try and talk to Mr. Schlickman about how to manage that. The wellness policy is is big. It has, it's recess, it's food in schools. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff. In, Boy. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, and so there are a lot of, some changes that we have to make to be in alignment. Um, and as all good groups do, lots of discussion about other uh, possible things. So um, yeah, it's a great group working really hard. So um, I, I think the plan is to try and have that done like this school year. Um, so then it would come to us and we would go from there. I think Mr. Thielman was chair of the, com uh, the subcommittee when we rewrote this last time around 2012 and it was an onerous task for which we threw rose petals at his feet with a lot of appreciation for guiding us through that. I've blocked I that mean, up. I'm expecting the rose petals because I didn't understand this was coming when I got put on this and uh, come April it'll be fun for somebody else to get those rose petals. Mm. Yeah. Yeah you might get reassigned. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah. Any other liaison reports? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Future agenda uh, announcements? Uh, just another report is that I did attend the MASC conference. We had two um, uh, resolutions uh, which were both adopted over by an overwhelming uh, margin. The one regarding um, representation on the State Board of Education, Worcester came in with an amendment looking for geographic diversity as well. Uh, folks wanted to add uh, diversity in, into that. Uh, there was also, uh, there's also a, um, I, I was on a panel for uh, the Safe Routes to School and uh, we talked about how Arlington was participating. We're, we're the first district in, in Massachusetts and one of the first two districts in the nation to be piloting this after uh, a couple of schools in the Bronx started. So we're, we're early leaders in this. And uh, at the vendors uh, tables, HMFH architects were handing out these wonderful postcards and you can see there's a 
very beautiful high school that is widely depicted mm. in, in their advertising. So um, I brought home a couple uh, for us so, so you can see it. Uh, a lot of pride in Arlington High on the part of our architects. Yeah. One little... One little report, just uh, thank you for the one. Is is I you know I did Dr. Holman, Dr. McNeil, and the whole team actually the whole leadership team, uh, Allison Elm, Elmer, the whole was at uh, Metco headquarters last night for the meeting with parents, and uh, it was it was a good it was a good session. So I my compliments to the team on mm -hmm. that, and uh, it was a chance to speak to a few parents about their experience and one little boy there, a kindergartner. Uh, so they have long days. These kids, they leave at yeah. six forty in the morning. They get home at. 4:30 in the afternoon, and they're all sleeping on the bus. Mm -hmm. The bus monitor told me so. It was a good. I it was felt like a good thing for. Mm -hmm. Be good for the school community, you know, if we can get out there sometime. They have a meeting there, so. I think we should. Yeah. I'm on. Okay. Yeah, it was good. Good. Good session. Really good session. Announcements. Future agenda items. <clears throat> Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Oh, somebody else is seconding. <laughs> Dang, we all have our jobs. <laughs> Mr. Carden. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Slickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. And I vote yes, that's unanimous. Meeting is adjourned. Bye, everyone.